I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. You know, we here at the story love history, and sometimes that means revisiting times that were not so great for certain groups. And that is what we're doing tonight. We want to make sure that we're all aware and do what we can to keep history from repeating itself. So that is our big story tonight. The specific type of history we're looking at is housing. Over the decades, there's been a fair amount of discrimination in Portland's housing history, much of it based on the color of someone's skin. So much history that there's even a bus tour now pointing out the lowlights. Our Tim Gordon recently took a ride. Meeting up for a four hour bus tour. It's the first of the season, appropriately starting up during Fair Housing Month. The group boarding the bus is from REACH CDC, a nonprofit dedicated to creating stable, affordable housing. Even for those well versed on the subject, there is a lot to take in when it comes to Oregon's history of housing discrimination, segregation, and displacement. So we often get asked, is housing discrimination still a problem? And the answer is yes, of course it is, though it may look different than it did 50 years ago. We drove by the bronze statue of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the Portland Convention Center. Dr. King standing with an immigrant, a worker and a child sets the tone. And there is a theme to this statue and that theme is really solidarity. First stop is the historic Albina neighborhood where black families were pushed to reside in the early 1900s. Racist policies and practices kept African Americans from living in other white neighborhoods for decades. So they developed a strong community here. It grew as black Americans from across the country, especially the South, moved here during and after the shipbuilding years of World War II, pushing the black population from a couple thousand to more than 20,000. A pocket of humanity where citizens are forced to live by poverty, by mutual need. A KGW documentary from 1967 focused on Albina, which from the 1950s to the 70s was torn apart by huge public projects from freeway building, to an expansion plan by Emanuel Hospital that cleared homes and businesses, but never happened. So African American families and people lost their homes and businesses due to this proposed expansion and moved further north. So there's a real loss of community that happened as businesses and gathering places were lost. Those empty blocks remain a difficult memory, but now, thanks to local activism, there is hope for new life here, with Lower Albina's history and inclusion in mind. So Vanport, the name actually means Vancouver, Portland. Next, our tour took us north to where Vanport used to be. It's an area of West Delta Park that includes Heron Lakes Golf Course, where we parked. My name's Ed Washington, and uh, I am a former Vanport resident. We heard from a man who moved here as a child. My family is from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, my dad came out here in 1942 to work in the shipyards with the idea that the family would follow, which we did in 1944. At its height, Vanport's population was about 42,000 people, both black and white, the second biggest city in the state. People lived in hastily built apartment homes to accommodate a mass of workers coming to toil in the wartime shipyards of Henry Kaiser. The only housing project in the entire country that had a public library. Ed Washington went on to be a civil rights activist and Metro's first black counselor. He says as a kid, despite experiencing some racism, Vanport was a good place to live. The housing was mostly segregated, but not the community or the schools where students, black and white, learned together. You know, growing up here, I always expected that I would become an old man in Vanport. At least that's what I thought back in those days, but that was not destined to happen. Just six years later, in 1948, a dike gave way and Vanport, built in the Columbia River floodplain, was ruined. A huge loss for the 17,000 still living there. Because this was all we had. It's all we had. And um, we, never, we never came back. Uh, within 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes, Vanport was completely underwater. With a half hour warning, most escaped, 15 residents died in the flood. Washington's family had to start over, eventually settling in Northeast Portland. Finding new housing was harder for black families from Vanport due to ongoing housing discrimination. They were forced to live here from May 2nd to September 10th of 1942. 
We didn't have to travel far to our next stop, the Portland Expo Center. In the 1940s, it was a livestock exposition building that served as a temporary internment center called the Portland Assembly Center for nearly 3,700 Japanese and Japanese Americans during World War II. Most were eventually moved to other internment camps in the West. My dad at the time was 16 uh, and he was a sophomore at Lincoln High School. Marlene Wallingford is a third generation Japanese American who tells a story of prison-like conditions for members of Oregon's Japanese communities. For many Japanese, their internment also meant the loss of property and businesses that they had worked hard to establish. Mothers came into the space and sat down and cried. It was hot and stuffy, and obviously, uh, if you have a livestock pavilion, it was att attracted a lot of flies. Asian communities, mostly Chinese and Japanese, faced the same historic housing discrimination as African Americans. On this corner, what you'll see is the Village Market, which is a community grocery store that's operated by the Janus Youth Program. There is more to the tour than we can fit in here, so we will end it with what feels like a positive, an improved way of life in the Portsmouth neighborhood. New Columbia, in 2003, it rebuilt and transformed the troubled Columbia Villa public housing into a mixed income neighborhood. New Columbia is a diverse community and there are 22 countries of origin represented and at least 17 different languages. Back where we started, a powerful presentation is over. These are issues and things that we continue to deal with. My feelings around it, it's painful. Stirring feelings in Victoria West that we need more change for the better. I think it takes courage to do this work. Anytime you're talking about fair housing or equity and inclusion, that's not easy work to do. I commend all the folks who spoke like I thank them. I'm here with Tim now. So super interesting. And what do they say? Is this, is this kind of blatant discrimination still going on in our city? You know, not the same kind of blatant discrimination I think the Fair Housing Council of Oregon would say, but there's certainly underlying discrimination still happening with all groups that are, you know, in need of housing in our state. But what they say is they take 2,000 calls a year there at the Fair Housing Council of Oregon, and half of those come from folks with disabilities, which kind of makes sense. It's the largest protected class in our country, and these are folks that are having issues, they say, with everything from not being allowed to service animals to maybe ADA access into apartments, and a lot of this is for rentals, uh, to just outright harassment. So those are the calls they're taking and trying to help people with that. And for folks who want to take the tour like you did, how do they do that? All right, well, it's pretty straightforward, except it's really sold out. So it's, oh. it's hard to do. But, you know, they have 30 tours uh, this season, and they're all booked with groups. Basically, there's a group tour. But they do have usually some uh, individual seats, maybe a couple on a bus, so you can get on that uh, wait list to see if you can get one of those seats. But also groups, like uh, any group, can call and set up for maybe next year to do that. It's a 50 seat bus and it, it really was a very powerful tour to take. And it's done through the Fair Housing folks? Yeah, Fair Housing Council of Oregon and they are there to help and they also encourage people to give them a call even if they kick out of the bus tour they might be able to help them get involved and get educated as well. Okay, great stuff. Thank you Tim Thanks. Gordon. You bet. Interesting. So what do you think about the housing discrimination tour? Did you or someone you know live or currently live, used to live in one of those neighborhoods and you'd like to share any memories? Tell us about it, will you? You can send us an email. The address is thestory at kgw.com or call and leave a voicemail. The number is 503-226-5090. Now let's get to some of your thoughts on our big story from last night. Blair Best finished her series sitting down with the major mayoral candidates for Portland to ask them about their strategy for the homeless crisis if they're elected in November. Last night featured current city commissioner Carmen Rubio. She didn't really tell Blair many concrete things that she would do, but she did say that Portland Street Response needs full support and she would continue to fund the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Otherwise, she said the way things are now is not really a system. She said there are good things happening, but none of it's really knitted together. Some of you liked what you heard from Rubio, others not so much. Let's start with the positive. Martha wrote to us to say, I thought that Rubio did an incredible job during the interview with Blair. She continued to say that we can't leave the table, that we have to solve the problem, and that all the players have to work together. Perhaps she will be able to expedite that type of cooperation that's needed among the players to solve the problem. But Scott did not agree. He told us, Commissioner Carmen Rubio speaks in comforting platitudes and pleasant sound bites, 
but in my opinion, it sounds like a vote for Mayor Carmen Rubio equals a vote for more of the same failed policies with persistent homeless tents, trash, and graffiti throughout Portland. And here's a voicemail we got last night. My summary of what she had to say was blah, 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 blah. But Lolly said they liked what they heard last night, writing, I watched all three interviews with Maps, Gonzalez, and although Maps and Gonzalez were much more clear on how they answered questions, Rubio seems to be the candidate I like. She seems to want to work with the county to solve the Portland homeless crisis. Blair actually did four of those interviews. City Commissioner Mingus Maps, local CEO and nonprofit founder Keith Wilson, and Commissioners Renee Gonzalez and Carmen Rubio. If you missed any of those, you can find them right now on KGW Plus. That's our free streaming app that you can find on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire. Just search KGW and download it to your home screen so that you can catch up on the story whenever you miss an episode. Or you can find each segment on the KGW YouTube page. To find that section, go to the KGW YouTube page, scroll down a bit until you see the bolded words, The Story, and click that. That will bring you to the story page where videos are listed in chronological order, the most recent at the top, going back in time as you scroll down. Yeah, hopefully that'll help you a little bit. Elsewhere, a gun shop owner in Kelso is at the center of a lawsuit over Washington State's ban on high-capacity ammunition magazines. Yesterday, a judge in Cowlitz County ruled the ban was unconstitutional, but then less than two hours later, the Washington Attorney General filed for and got an emergency stay from another court, which keeps the ban in place while the ruling's reviewed. The law first went into effect back in 2022, but the gun shop Gators Custom Guns decided to ignore it and keep selling high capacity magazines. Those are magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. The attorney general filed a lawsuit against the gun shop, so Gators challenged the constitutionality of the law. And the owner, Wally Wentz, told us today he never expected the fight to end in Cowlitz County Court, but he believes the constitution is on his side. It's gonna be a tough argument for them to throw this out. And if they do, it's, the, it's really gonna smell like fish, really. And we're not sure that we believe that the state Supreme Court is willing to take a flat, fat lip or a black eye over just playing along. We're going to plead the case again at the next level up. If we do lose in there, we will appeal, just like we knew that state would appeal this week. We get to them folks with black dresses, it's going to be a dogfight. Wentz says he and his staff sold hundreds of high capacity magazines yesterday in just the 90 minutes or so between the time the judge struck down the ban and the state stay was put back in place. Lawmakers in Washington who sponsored the law say they're also not giving up and that they believe that banning high capacity magazines reduces gun violence. The fact that that we continue in this country to tolerate gun violence at the level that we have uh, and have this expectation that increasing access to guns is going to somehow Im impact that for the better, I think is nonsense. Uh, we need to have real common sense gun safety laws. We've been working in that direction here in Washington, as you have seen. Uh, and uh, and it seems to me that people's lives are at stake. A hearing with the commissioner of the Washington Supreme Court is set for next week, which will determine if the stay on the ruling will stay or remain in place. Meanwhile, Oregon's major gun control law, Measure 114, also in lawsuit limbo. That law would also ban high capacity magazines, along with requiring permits for gun purchases. A Harney County judge ruled in November that it's unconstitutional and cannot be enforced. This past February, the state of Oregon appealed that ruling to the state court of appeals. It's still working its way through that system. Still ahead on the story, a new proposal at Portland Public Schools that would offer some kids a taste of military life. Junior ROTC programs that could be coming, but some say they have no place in Portland schools. We'll explain why when the story returns.
Portland Public Schools is thinking about allowing junior ROTC programs in some of its schools. It's an idea that created intense backlash among some. We got an email from a viewer named Jane suggesting we look into it. I'd like to suggest that the story cover the controversial recommendation that JROTC be adopted in Portland High Schools. The school board will decide on this in the next couple of months. Community members would be interested in this issue. Well, Jane, our team reads all of our viewer emails and we take them seriously. And often we do end up pursuing the stories that you folks suggest. So to all of you, please keep them coming. Tell us what stories you want us to look into. All right, here we go, Jane. The R JROTC is a military program for high school students which operates in thousands of schools nationally. The Army says students learn values of service to the country. Cadets have competitions and some can earn scholarships. But it's uncommon in Oregon. Just five schools have the program here. And as Thomas Schultz reports, as you can tell from those numbers, the program definitely has its local critics. After a Portland Public School proposal emerged to add JROTC programs, some pushed back. If kids want to sign up for the military, they can go down to the recruiting station and talk to a recruiter, you know. John Gresho was a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War. He says instead of adding JROTC programs, Portland Public should prioritize vocational studies. Others disagree. It gives kids like that a something to strive for. When, James Hebe you know, is a state representative representing the, parts uh, of Clackamas uh, County. He also served in the Marine Corps and says JROTC gives students direction. It would have made things a lot easier for me. It would have uh, filled up a lot of my time in the afternoons and kept me out of a little bit of mischief. And a Portland public spokesperson says schools would have the choice to add or forego JROTC programs, though the proposal comes at a time when PPS is shedding staff as part of $30 million in budget cuts. And in a letter to board members, district officials say it's unknown how Portland public would pay for JROTC, though they're just beginning to examine how JROTC curriculum aligns with career and technical education programs. And as PPS moles adding JROTC in schools, debates swirl outside of class. They're preying on students who have no other choice and who see their way out of systematic inequality as the military. I think it's a great honor to serve my country. Thomas Schultz reporting there. Let us know what you think, William. Should Portland schools add JROTC programs? Is it a good opportunity for students, or do you think the military should stay away from them? Let us all know what your opinions are. All opinions on all sides are welcome right here. The address is the story at KGW.com, or you could also call and leave a voicemail. That phone number is 503-226-5090. Coming up next on the story, we're turning our attention to the Washington and Oregon coasts because razor clam season is here. There have been concerns in the past about domoic acid in the clams that can make people sick. When we come back, we'll learn what the latest testing shows. That's when the story returns.
Razor clam digging season is in full swing and scientists and tribes are monitoring the waters, testing for toxins to make sure those clams are safe to eat. Erica Zuko with our Environment Northwest team traveled to the Washington coast to better understand how the most common toxin forms and what's being done about that. Digging for these guys is a tradition for people across the Northwest, and it's also a boost to industry along the coast. It's a pastime passed on for generations. Wesley, there's another one right there beside me. Five years old, my mom taught me how to plant big plants. Once I learned how, that was it. You had to dig your own. And I'm 58 years old, so that's a long time. A way to feel connected Three, four, five. to the coastline. You just hit the ground a little bit, and the clam will, will react. He'll, he'll pull his head back down. Oh, there it is. If digging for razor clams is a Pacific Northwest art. Now, I'm not a professional at anything, but I'm an expert about everything. Making sure they're safe to eat is the corresponding science. Hey, good afternoon. I'm with Fish and Wildlife collecting interview data. Did you guys Biologist Bryce Blumenthal and other scientists dig for answers. All right, guys. All right got me. They don't like this. Let's go. Oh, you got some <laughs> On beaches like this one in Grayland, they take tally of clam populations. You got your 15 clam limit? Both of us did, yeah. And sample the species to check for toxins, which can grind this season to a halt. The toxin that shuts us down most often is demilic acid. Demilic acid causes amnesic shellfish poisoning. Uh, in, in severe cases, it causes death and permanent brain damage. And, you know, in mild cases, it's, it's uh, an upset stomach and, and, a, and a pretty bad time. The acid was first to blame for closing razor clam digs in the 90s. And last summer, pelicans along the California coast died from eating demoic acid tainted anchovies. More than 20 people got sick from poisoned shellfish. Couldn't, couldn't grasp anything and hold it. That's when a Washington Department of Health lab first discovered demoic acid in razor clams, and it caused the state to cancel the rest of the season. Here's how the acid is formed. Sunlight, warm temperatures, and shallow water make algae grow faster into large blooms. We see lots of types, many harmless, across the Northwest. But one type, called Pseudonicha, can produce the toxin demoic acid. Razor clams consume it, and while it doesn't kill them, it can cause sickness in people and animals who eat them. Blumenthal says when tests show unsafe levels, Fish and Wildlife has to issue closures. Both Washington and Oregon have been forced to do so near summertime or around marine heat waves, though at this point there isn't a clear trend line over time. That's like the big question mark. Is this our new normal or is this like closure every other year? That's not the work that we do. Um, we just kind of manage the fishery and we just um, roll with the punches as they come. But some researchers are looking into what the future could bring. A recent study examined how a marine heat wave sparked a new demoic acid hotspot on the West Coast, and more work is being done to unearth trends. In the meantime, scientists and local partners have developed early detection and warning systems to help gain a better understanding of exactly which areas are impacted so closures only happen when and where they have to. There's a lot of people who come out here and, and uh, stay in hotels and patron local businesses, and so it's a huge um, economic driver for, for coastal Washington. Fish and Wildlife publishes data about acid levels at Washington beaches, and so far, 2024 testing has not revealed dangerous outbreaks. But they'll keep checking. Ah, there you are. Just like local clam diggers do. Got it? There it is. As they take part in this time-honored tradition. For Environment Northwest, I'm Erica Zuko. Man, those beaches are beautiful, and that looks like a lot of fun. Hopefully the toxins stay away. Hey, that's the end of our show. Thanks so much for watching. Remember the story, our collective story. That never ends. The good stuff's coming your way next, and I'll see you right back here tomorrow night at 630.